is no place to escape to. This is the last time. Oh, On the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. He's a chutney farmer. Come and eat his clag nuts. Come and have a can smacker. Up his curry bongo. Take it up the bum. Up me, uh, prick sombrero? Yep, prick sombrero. That really works. I'm a council grifter. I'm a council grifter. Gritter. Come, council come, gritter. Uh, come and suck me clinkers. <laughs> <laughs> Which is another good one. Lovely, Man, lovely, Jimmy, lovely. Well, Jimmy Savile really could put together a, a nice song. Turn of phrase. He's really a mem who really knew how to do a turn of phrase. It's incredible, and he's one of the men that we'll be talking about here today oh. on Last Podcast on the Left. My oh, name's sure. Marcus Parks. I am Henry Zabrowski. And I am disgusted with both of you. Very good. <laughs> I'm so excited <laughs> to That's find Ed Larson with us. I'm finally, this is a true, old-fashioned, last podcast on the left subject. Yeah. It's been a minute because, again, it's relatable because who doesn't like to crack open a couple of cold ones after work? <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> Come on, you fuckers. <laughs> Woo. 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 It's about to get fucking Ugh. nasty. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, my first question is like, how illegal is this? Well, it varies from state to state, and I will answer your questions as we go along. Oh, I was more talking about us talking about it. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is Free commentary. speech. Free speech. I'm Free out of speech. <laughs> no, man, this is good. I'm, uh, whoo, yeah, come on. Today we're talking necrophilia. Yay. Ladies and gentlemen. We're getting mm. deep into this subject. Oh, yeah. And that's a, another good turn of phrase. <laughs> Did you go to the Necrophilia Museum in Los Angeles? Necrophilia Museum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Liza Minnelli's house. <laughs> <laughs> you got him! <laughs> ah, yeah! <laughs> got him! <laughs> now, to the uneducated. Oh, God. Defining necrophilia seems like it would be a simple task, i.e. a necrophiliac is someone who has sex with dead bodies. But in having this, frankly, unenlightened opinion. You'd be oversimplifying a massively complicated and fascinating paraphilia that has no less than 10 distinct subdivisions. Don't put your record collector eyes on this. <laughs> All right? This is ain't about like, what's the most hipster version of having sex with a corpse? All right? Because it sounds like it's just you that views it as a, com a, a complex gray rainbow. Uh, yeah. It is not just me. It is also the author of the textbook, Necrophilia. Forensic and Medical Legal Aspects by Anil Agrawal. Mm. Also, the same part, the person who really breaks this down is the author of Grave Desire, A Cultural History of Necrophilia. That's Steve Finbo. I was going through a couple of academic papers because I was trying to find some more like, why? <laughs> Answers like, why? How do we get here? And it's funny because there really isn't a lot of like sort of academic pursuit of the subject. And one like author wrote this thing being like, you know, it's, it is absolutely fascinating. And I just can't believe there's not a lot more directed study on necrophilia. And it's like, it's necrophilia. <laughs> yeah. And so it's not popular. It's yeah. not super popular. It's not on the trending topics. No. We're not, we are not going to hit the top of TikTok. <laughs> Well, I don't know if they have necro talk. Yeah. Yeah. TikTok as in seconds to live. <laughs> <laughs> there must be some kind of necro talk. I'm going to look that up. All right. While you look it up, I'm going to read you a delightful passage from Grave Desire. Okay. The necrophile becomes a mythical monster in order for society to maintain a moral status quo. Necrophilia becomes the ultimate fetish, the last paraphilia. The weather gauge for society's moral storm. It's fucking a corpse. You yeah. know what I mean? It's you not. can't make it pretty. You can't pretty it up. No one's doing it cool. There's no Elvis of necrophilia. You know, like there's nobody who's bringing it to the masses. There's no Taylor Swift bringing it yeah. from country to pop. Yeah, if you were cool, you'd fuck the living. Yeah. Yeah, that's the idea. Most cool people do. Yeah. This, this story... Let's just say it lacks charmers. Uh -huh. yeah. You know what I mean? There's, there's nobody in here. Even every serial killer we've covered, we've always kind of found like, there's like, uh, not always, but sometimes you, there's like a relatable point. Something. You know, yeah. and yeah. we're, we're going to get into why, you know, like what we're talking about here today. But these are people that make their whole nut fucking corpses. Yeah. 
You know, because a necrophile, when you say the word necrophile, it just sounds like a guy who opens up a corpse butthole and starts smelling it. And he's like, I'm getting, I'm getting good seed. I'm getting tennis balls. I'm getting cedar. (laughs) Well, if we must put it into a box, necrophilia in its purest form. You mean a fucking casket? (laughs) Vagina, Henry. Come on. Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> Necrophilia in its purest form is sexual gratification that comes from having an encounter with the dead. If you want to get granular with it, the act itself is called necrocoitus, while the more Greek among you might call it thanatophilia. Have you ever seen Necromantic? Oh, uh, I don't think so. I know the band Necromantics. That's cool. No, it's one of those movies that, you know, when I was a younger man, I was always looking for whatever was the single most fucked up thing I could see. Yeah. yeah. Right. I loved every, I loved it. I was always, I was fascinated with it. And it was about six months ago. I'd never seen Necromantic before. And it's on the list of all the most fucked up movies ever. And because it's about like a, a guy that we'll cover today, a truly romantic version of necrophilia. Yeah. But um, Tom Petty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But he got to, uh, it, I couldn't watch it. Yeah. It's really gross. I was like, oh man, I'm getting fucking soft, man. Wow, you really the same. are getting soft in your old age. What's Ooh, happening? I don't know. Well, maybe I can toughen you up with some of this shit because it's going to get fucking awful. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, often, but not always, necrophilia is coupled with other transgressive acts like sadism, murder, cannibalism, vampirism, and necrophagia. Necrophagia is different from cannibalism because necrophagia is the act of eating the flesh of the dead raw for sexual gratification. Often, cannibalism is uh, cooked, like it's prepared. uh, There's more often like rituals accompany cannibalism. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it also, because a lot of times it's tagged on. To other crimes. Exactly. This is uh, something eating raw is called Susie Sashimi. <laughs> <laughs> now, what if the person's still alive when you eat part of them? Uh, that would be cannibalism. That's, that's cannibalism. cannibalism? Yeah, that's definite cannibalism because okay. necrophagia is specifically flesh from a dead body. Because there have been people that have been willingly cannibalized. Yeah. 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 There's also necropedophilia and necrobestiality, both of which are self explanatory. Mm-hmm. No, they aren't. <laughs> I don't understand. Sex with dead children, sex with dead animals. Thank you. Thank you so much. (laughs) Now, the spectrum for necrophilia runs wide, Mm. from a mere obsession with corpses to the act of murdering to obtain, mutilate, and possibly eat corpses, a la Jeffrey Dahmer or Dennis Nilsson. But for today... They were the closest we have to an Elvis of necrophilia. (laughs) Dahmer, I suppose, would be the closest to an Elvis of necrophilia. Or Ted Bundy. Yeah, Ted Bundy, yes. also necrophiliac. Yes. Yeah. Good yeah. work. You did the reading. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but for today, we're going to shift our focus away from the more infamous necrophiliacs to some of the lesser known practitioners, the ones who seek out bodies that are already dead or those who have a romantic attraction to specific dead bodies they had previous relationships with. I also think this is, how do I put this? pure necrophiliacs. These are guys who are not doing it just because they're curious after they killed somebody and they're a serial killer because they're a serial killer first, necrophiliac second, right? These are guys that focus in on this because, again, it's its own art form. It is. But although I would argue that Jeffrey Dahmer was a necrophiliac first and a serial killer second. Cannibal third? Well, again... Sure. Yes. Yes. I, but it's interesting. Well, yeah. I mean, that's a that's a long conversation we can have <laughs> that ruin many people's <laughs> afternoon. Yeah. You know, Thanksgiving's coming up. People. I I'm yeah. gonna save it. Mm. My mom's in town. We can do it at the smokehouse. <laughs> mm. Oh God. Yes. Do you think they would do it for us? Yes. <laughs> Just walk in with half an arm. It's like we have a special request. <laughs> uh, yes. 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 No worry. It's going. <laughs> tell, tell him it's her birthday. Tell him it's her birthday. We'll do it. We'll put a candle in it. <laughs> Now, as you might imagine, 95% of necrophiliacs are men, Mm -hmm. or at least 95% of necrophiliacs who are caught are men. Mm -hmm. But that 5% of female necrophiles can be quite chatty when they want to be. (laughs) I feel like we (laughs) They like to talk. When we were talking on the phone, I think partially it's that, too, where it's most of the time you have to hear from the necrophiliac if they've done it. And the thing about being a dude is that we leave shoot. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Right? We yeah. leave the spider webs. A lady, yeah, you can leave a slug trail. Yeah. But it's harder to see. It is harder to see. However, the necrophiliac we're going to talk about right now, Karen Greenlee, did leave behind a bit of a trail. Oh, yes. 
Karen Greenlee, whom we've mentioned in the past, is covered in Carla Valentine's paper, Dead Inside, Female Necrophilia, UK Law, and the Penetration Paradox. Penetration Paradox is going to be my DJ set. <laughs> That's my album. From my <laughs> well, Karen Greenlee was a self-described morgue rat, and she claimed to have had sex with somewhere between 20 and 40 men. It's a big difference. Hmm? That's a big difference. Between now 20 and 40? It's either double or... <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it's, it's a fucking whirlwind in there, man. If they say 20 to 40, it's 60. <laughs> <laughs> Especially necrophiliacs. Yeah. Where she said that she would spend hours in the morgue riding bodies cowgirl style. And her version of a male orgasm during these riding sessions would be when blood or other fluids would spill from the mouth of the deceased during necrocoitus. That's she why said, you don't let them get on top. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Exactly why? my hair. Um, she said that she really liked sixty nine. She'd rub the clit on the nose, mm-hmm. and then she also said she, she found the order of death extremely erotic. Oh, now you got your body that's been floating in the bay for two weeks, or a burn victim that doesn't attract me much, but a freshly embalmed corpse is something else. Why are you giving her that voice? She's from fucking Sacramento. Oh, I love this. Well, Karen, she would even attend the funerals of the corpses she defiled. I would get to mourn right along with the family at the loss of that loved one. Except I was groaning in a little different tone. Mm. Mm. I was coming. Oh, you're crying, mommy? Going to the funeral is a little more respectful than just banging a random corpse. You're going to see a lot of people who go to the funeral. It's you a see, pretty good. common practice. <laughs> you, see, you say respectful. I think, I, honestly, it's more into the paraphilia. It's building up tension. You're mm-hmm. going yeah. to, you're being a part of this process. You're making it personal in your way. Like, you have... This paraphilia to us, like we're making fun of it and making fun of necrophilia to them. This is extremely personal and romantic and complex and they mm-hmm. view it as legit. So yeah. in that realm, that's like a date for them yeah. going to their funeral. By 1979, Greenlee's obsession had reached a fever pitch. One night, she stole a hearse with a body inside from the mortuary in Sacramento where she worked. She then used the body for sex for two days before she was found overdosed on codeine in the back of the hearse. I think the codeine probably had something to do with some of the necrophilia. <laughs> the co- the codeine addiction? Yeah. I don't know. Codeine makes you sleepy. Yeah. And she, from how she describes it, her sex life was quite active. I get horny when I'm sleepy. You get horny when you're sleepy? Yeah. Weird. That is weird. I get hungry. Good. I get sleepy. I go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but since there was no law on the books in California against specifically necrophilia at the time, yeah, man. she was only fined $255 and sentenced to 11 days in jail for interfering with the burial and illegally driving a hearse. You know, that's a frustrated ass judge. Oh, yeah. She's trying to sit me like, I want to figure out what to do with you, ma'am. And meanwhile, she's going like, I can't wait until you die. I'm going to fuck your bones. It's legal. It's legal. You'll be pleased to know, however, that a section of the California Health and Safety Code was amended in 2004 to explicitly forbid necrophilia. And this was signed into law by none other than Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Hell yeah. You know why? Because he loved muscles. And muscles <laughs> require blood. Or he <laughs> was gonna, thought he was going to do it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I've got to stop. I've got to terminate necrophilia. <laughs> <laughs> well, this delay in outlawing necrophilia specifically is actually pretty common. Because most states are reticent to put necrophilia on the books until they absolutely have to. Do you think it's because, like, partially... Is it giving people ideas? I don't think it's giving people ideas because I, only about 40 states have gotten around to making it specifically illegal. There's still 10 states out there. I'm not going to tell you which ones Ugh, yeah, where yeah. you can still legally be a necrophile. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't New understand. Mexico. <laughs> why is it so hard? Like, why is, truly, why well, is it so hard to get them to, to come down... On necrophilia. Uh, I think it's because, I mean, there's no federal statute. Because we don't want to lock up Biden's wife. Yeah! (laughs) Yeah! 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 Got him! (laughs) Let me be clear. I am not dead. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, there's no federal statute forbidding necrophilia because I think no senator wants to be known as the guy who put the necrophilia provision in the latest crime bill. I know my constituents love to fuck the dead. <laughs> I know that. I will keep it legal. <laughs> I know they do. Have you heard the term of fuck what they said, what the necrophiliac term for like the R is a group of people like mostly they want meat on the bone, but there is a group that love just fucking skeletons and coming all over skeletons. I think coming all over skeletons would be the operative word. It's masturbating. When is the meetup, Marcus? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You can rub You're your not dick. catching me. You're not catching me out. You could put it through the rib cage. You could put it through the pelvis hole. I guess yeah. you could put it through the rib cage. That's it's a pretty. Like, that's a pretty small opening, though. It's a fr- It's like more like rubbing. It's a rubbing. A but friction. They, they call it pork in the bone. Mm. <laughs> Who's they? This guy. (laughs) (laughs) But if you're wondering about the aforementioned penetration paradox when it comes to female necrophiles, some use erectile dysfunction vacuum pumps to manually generate an erection in deceased men. Or so they claim. Yeah. Others say they use hydraulic pumps that are attached to thin plastic tubes that are inserted and sutured into the dead phallus. However, I'm inclined to agree with author Carla Valentine when she brings these claims into question. I would agree. Yeah. Because, again, that takes a lot of time. You're talking about a lot of time in a room with cameras trying to film a lot of... If you're getting at a corpse that's in a hospital, it'll take some time. Yeah, if you're in that situation. But Karen Greenlee, I mean, she was doing her shit in the 70s. Not a lot of surveillance cameras in the morgue. And she said that she would have hours with the corpse. Uh, And if you have a penis pump, like, that's just... You're done in five seconds. A lot of bush hair in that time period. Risk of sounding like an idiot. What about rigor mortis? Exactly. Well, everyone talks about the so-called angel lust, in which a dead body achieves an erection post-mortem. You heard of that? Yeah. You heard about this? Yeah, well, that, you heard I didn't know this? it was Have called angel this? lust, but I knew you get hard when you die. Yeah, Is called- that true? I actually didn't know that. You didn't know about angel lust? No, I don't get Angel Lust magazine, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows that if this podcasting thing didn't work out, I was going to go to mortuary sciences school. Of course. I know this stuff. Of course. But Angel Lust usually only happens in hanging deaths or other forms of death in which there is intense pressure on the cerebellum. It also doesn't happen hours or days after death. And it doesn't just happen to men either. When women are hung, their vaginas will also engorge. The clitoris will also engorge. And in some cases, blood shoots out of the vagina. So my question: wow. So when it, it just gets big, just gets it in court. It looks but, like Homer Simpson mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen those. Have you seen those, that meme? Yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. But it all—it doesn't happen hours or days after death. It's something that happens in the immediate. Uh, in, in the immediate time right after death. Maybe our coroners or mortuary workers could help us out with this. Yes, so please email sidesourceLPOTL at gmail.com. But Valentine says that the claims of pumps, hydraulic or manual, are dubious at best considering the amount of congealed blood contained in a dead penis. On this subject, I will defer to the professionals and we shall give an update on side stories. Thank you. I do know that a penis, after a certain period of composition, does blow up like a balloon uh, until it bursts, much like the stomach well. Yeah, uh, it's you know gases, you know various in- insects that are you know of course maggots are going to be everywhere by that. Do you time. want more of the cornbread <laughs> stuffing, Marcus? <laughs> do you want? Do you like dark meat, right, Marcus? Now, speaking of coroners and mortuary workers, you may not be surprised to know that certain jobs attract necrophilia. Yeah, but mm-hmm. some of these professions are less obvious than others. Yeah, guys who work at toll booths, the um, <laughs> anybody at a DMV, <laughs> you know, um, like I worked IRS. at Buffalo Wild Wings, and we. A couple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we expect the grave diggers, cemetery employees, and mortuary attendants to have a higher percentage than other folk. Necrophiles are also prevalent in the ranks of soldiers, ambulance drivers, and volunteer firefighters. Because they got the freshies. Yeah, they get the freshies. And then think about why pedophiles are attracted to being teachers, priests, pl- the senators. Yeah. Like, partially what that does is it gives you, because again, it uh, people then, it's built into your role that they trust you. Yeah. Oh, man. Now, crazy thought. What if, like, an EMT doesn't save somebody just so they could fuck them? 
Very possible. Oh, yeah. It's That's very, crazy. very possible. Yeah, it's basically any profession in which a corpse is likely to show up. And if the urge is strong enough, then yeah, they might not give CPR to that corpse uh, in order to, you know touch about because well that's the thing we'll get into what emts are mostly into and firefighters okay. they're not really into the actual fucking of not the all of them <laughs> not every emt not every firefighter no not just every. the volunteers <laughs> <laughs> why do you not get paid for this oh, i get paid <laughs> oh don't worry i get mine <laughs> we'll, we'll get to their area of necrophilia later okay now while we think of necrophilia as a lowly crime committed by subhuman beasts this transgression occurs with fair regularity in the ancient histories amongst the great men. According to the Babylonian Talmud, composed between 300 and 600 CE, King Herod the Great sentenced his second wife to death for committing adultery. Then he had her body embalmed in honey and sword for seven years, where, quote, his sexual desire for his mellified wife remained as strong as as when she was alive. Oh, this is one of those you don't know because King Herod the Great was like not super popular. Yeah. So you find out later on like why, you know, you don't know what's a rumor or what's not rumor. Sure. I just keep seeing Alice Cooper. <laughs> yeah. Because that's, he played King Herod in the um, Jesus Christ Superstar. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Look at this. Well, there was also the psychopathic tyrant Periander of Corinth, one of the seven sages of Greece. He accidentally killed his pregnant wife when he threw a footstool at her head. He then defiled her corpse burned his concubines alive, and sent two of his sons away to become eunuchs for reasons that are unclear. What the concubines do? Exactly. That's also unclear. You know Perhaps what's hard about concubines is that they have all the secrets. And they're the, they're the ones that are a lot of times they get the, the wife or queen, whatever, will be more of a political position. And the concubines are actually the ones getting to know the man. And, yeah. and it could also be some sort of weird like expression of guilt. I accidentally killed my pregnant wife. Now I have to get rid of my concubines and I have to. But, but that's the thing is that none of it actually hurts him. Yeah. Uh, it only hurts the people around him. And he's an interesting guy because he is a tyrant, which mm -hmm. at the time was also weird because it was about taking a land away from the rich. So who knows? I don't know what that means. However, Greek historian Herodotus did give my personal favorite euphemism for necrophilia. Concerning the defilement of Periander of Corinth's pregnant wife's body, Herodotus wrote that, quote, Periander baked his bread. In a cold oven. <laughs> That's good. That makes sense. <laughs> That's freezer. <laughs> well, surprisingly, great and lowly men alike are not the only organisms to engage in necrophilia. Oh, wow. The act of having sex with the dead is quite common in the animal kingdom. Okay. Particularly in birds. Yeah. Okay. Crows. You know. Penguins. I don't trust birds. Ducks. Well, ducks got the corkscrew penis. Ducks oh, yeah. are the worst. That's got to be, I get maybe it's easier for them to have sex with another dead one. But, but also, you just fucking put it in. Yeah, any... and wind them up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also don't know if it's, you know, how far does the necrophilia go? Are they just rubbing their bird dicks on it? Like, or is it just, are they really fucking whatever hole they can get at? With They're it? penetrating. Oh, in well. one nature study in the Netherlands, drake mallards were seen copulating with a dead male drake for almost 75 minutes. And we should know, I times the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going, interesting. I was like, why does he not want my bread? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. He is baking his bread in, in a, a cold, cold oven. oven. <laughs> Additionally, necrophilia is quite common amongst the marine mammals, sea lions, sea otters, and especially the sea's worst sex offender, the dolphin. Hey, man, come on, leave them alone, all right? They're just from Miami. They learned <laughs> from watching us. <laughs> now, as far as why people become necrophiles, it's hard to pin it on any one factor. Yeah. Most because if, if there was one factor, <laughs> we could, I think we could nip that yeah. butt. <laughs> <laughs> Most believe it's about control, the absence of conflict, the higher likelihood of getting away with the crime, mm -hmm. the impossibility of rejection. There's the, a lot of things that go into the it. The impossibility yeah. of rejection is what every pop psych slash other, any one of these other papers I was reading, they all just say that. It's because they can't say no. Well, I think it's much more complicated than that. I do too. Most fascinating, however, is the relationship between necrophilia and the perpetrator's sense of smell. Now, I'm going to say this as a warning right now, because I know I have met several listeners over the years that do not have a sense of smell. Sure. I got a cousin with no sense of smell, and I love farting around. You see? <laughs> uh, but the thing is, is that Marcus has a theory. I have a theory. Okay. He believes. Well, I have a theory. Because in general... A far higher percentage of necrophiliacs suffer from a diminished sense of smell when compared to the general population. We don't think you, as a listener, <laughs> with no sense of smell, are maybe, are, we don't think that you're more, like, 
able to be a necrophiliac. But you are. <laughs> <laughs> you just might have been born with a certain set of skills. That's not my that's not my theory at all. My theory doesn't go against the people with no sense of smell. My theory goes against the rest of humanity. Because mm. I think this begs the question as to whether or not more people would be necrophiliacs if they didn't have the instinctual repellent reaction that's hardwired into our brains concerning decomposing flesh. What's funny is that I think that that's actually like a theist point of view of like, why aren't we all raping everybody if God isn't there to tell us no? no. I'm talking about pure biological reaction. Yeah. Like, I'm, I have, feel like there's a lot more <laughs> in the room besides it's just smell. It's a dead body. Yeah. And I've had to break into a morgue. There's a dead body on the table. Yeah. It's got an autopsy scar down the middle of it. It's got like <laughs> shit. It's like, you know, it's got the face. It's going to look on its horror on its face because it died Unless in its it's sleep. a freshie. <clears throat> no, the freshie, because then it's got it's got a ruddiness. It's also the, I would say your sight affects you <laughs> from having sex with the corpse. So I would it, say your emotions, a lot of, it's an emotional factor. I don't think it's just like, I don't smell <laughs> a dead corpse. And you're like, oh yeah, excellent. This one's I can get it. It still smells like perfume. Yeah. Where it's like, no, no, no. I think that there's an emotional quotient that might keep you from having sex with the corpse. Perhaps. Yeah. So you have to no sense of smell and be insane. Yeah, it helps. Yeah, I've, yeah, but there are many insane people out there. And I also wonder if necrophilia has recently been on the uptick because of long COVID infections, oh, no. considering oh, no. how many what people lost their sense of smell yeah. and considering the number of people who came out of their infection with a scrambled brain. I yes. can't wait Called for the people saying the, that we have blamed necrophilia on COVID. <laughs> I, I I can't wait for the responses from the various doctors. Side stories, LPOTL at gmail.com. How do you feel about yeah. COVID causing rampant necrophilia <laughs> amongst the world? Do you suffer from dong COVID? <laughs> 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 now, the term necrophile was coined in the year 1850 by a psychiatrist named Joseph Guislain to replace the previous charge that would sometimes be placed on those who interfered with the dead. Before people could be charged with necrophilia, they would sometimes be charged with vampirism. It was an actual crime okay. in certain countries, France, England. They had it on the books. The vampirism charge brings us to our first case, that involving Sergeant Francois Bertrand a.k.a. the Vampire of Montparnasse. This will also bring the first of many, many, many yes. French necrophiles covered on today's episode. I will say it is very, it's a very European like thing versus a lot of American necrophiles. Again, we're multitaskers. Yeah. We yeah. work really hard. We like we never stop. We don't know how. We're also, a land of, we're also a land of freedom. We're a land of freedom here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And but our necrophilia, a lot of times, big cases of necrophilia, we see are tied to serial killing. Mm -hmm. Where it seems like Europe really has the no kill, like, you know, was it catch and release version of necrophilia? <laughs> like way more than we do. Yeah. It's well, all those extra vacation days. <laughs> <laughs> Idle hands are indeed the devil's plaything. Get back to work, Europe. Right from your grave. Now, according to Bertrand himself, he had a strong desire to mutilate corpses from a young age, but he never killed to obtain those corpses. In fact, only one person that we'll cover today actually killed anybody. But what I'll also say is that the majority of our stories today also come from the 18th and 19th century. If I were to say why, I'd guess it was because fresh bodies were easier to obtain then. Sure. See, embalming bodies didn't become common practice until it was perfected during the American Civil War, when transporting the bodies of soldiers from far-off locations back to their home soil came into high demand. Before then, where you died was where you were buried. So that's probably the second best thing that came from the Civil War. Necrophilia. No. <laughs> Embalming bodies oh. and the abolition of slavery is what he's trying to say. Oh, yes. No. Actually, yes. I would say yes. This meant that fresh corpses unsullied by unnatural chemicals, seemingly the necrophile's preference, were far easier to obtain prior to the proliferation of embalming. Therefore, a man like Francois Bertrand never had to kill anyone to obtain a fresh body. But the reason why I say that he might have killed someone if he had to was because he followed the same track that many serial killers we've covered in the past have gone down when it comes to escalating behavior. And you will call his behavior escalating, but I actually think it's pretty fucking extreme. 
from the beginning? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to it. You can't. I mean, you can start at extreme and get to like more extreme. super extreme. Yeah, Doritos. Like, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what they do. Yeah, yeah. But then he plateaued for a little bit. That's the thing. Yeah. Then yeah. where else do we go? Mm-hmm. Well, starting at a young age, Bertrand would masturbate to the corpses of horses, dogs, and cats. This is what I'm saying. Which I'd imagine were far more common in the mid 19th century. Dead animals everywhere. Sure. It's just the ah, uh, you know. It's extreme. Well, it's just but it's, it's not masturbating like, at a dead horse, which actually does sound like a new term of phrase. Masturbating yeah. to a dead horse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you need to stop masturbating. You're masturbating to a dead horse yeah. here. <laughs> because I don't know. I mean, again, I just don't understand what's so sexy about it. Yeah, but is it really a problem? That's not yet. The, I mean, that's the thing. Not yet. I would say, yeah. I mean, if I found <laughs> out that you were doing that, I'd have a hard time hiring you as an editor. Yeah. Like, I'd have a hard time hiring you as, like, anything, anything. I wouldn't want you to deliver Instacart to yeah. me. Yeah. No, no, especially, well, at least hand sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but right now we're at, like, we're at Cool Ranch Doritos Extreme. We're sure. not to, like, yeah. Axe Body Spray Extreme No, yet. not yet. No, no, no we're no, not no. getting up to that It's a gateway drug. Yeah. But in 1842, Bertrand joined the French army, which allowed him more access to a variety of dead animals because he spent more time traveling. Uh. The more you walk down the road, the more dead animals you're going to see. And I'd also imagine that regular battle produced a lot of dead horses. Oh, yeah. But by 1846, dead animals that Bertrand simply happened upon were no longer doing it for him. So he began to capture and mutilate living animals for masturbation purposes. You see, now we're now at... We, yes, yeah, it's getting worse. You're cheeseburger right. flavored. Blaze. <laughs> 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 that habit, however, evolved again the next year when Bertrand happened upon a cemetery in the city of Duel. According to what he later told doctors, he came across some grave digging tools that had been left next to a freshly dug grave. Uh, what is this? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> what do you wait a second? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> his head began to throb violently and his heart began to race, which would thereafter be the feeling that would precede any of his foul deeds. And before he knew it, Francois Bertrand was shoveling dirt away from a freshly dug grave in a race to the coffin. Once he unearthed the body, he began to strike it with the shovel over and over again. And the sound of metal tearing into flesh made him, quote, Delirious with lust and violence for two hours. Shit. That's a long time. I wish we could cut to our hymns commercial. <laughs> <during this. laughs> a couple nights later, the urge came upon him again. So he returned to the cemetery in the middle of a rainstorm, heavy with atmosphere. Oh, this is the time for me. <laughs> yeah, very romantic. It is whenever it rains, it washes your sins away. It goes either way. <laughs> ah. Oh, fra. <laughs> This time, however, the gravediggers hadn't left their tools behind. So Bertrand dug up the first freshly buried female corpse he could find with his bare hands. Far easier when, the, you know, the soil is broken up with the you rain. Would, sure. Yeah, no, I, I, you wet the ground if you're really wanting to do some good digging. It's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you not gotten your spring issue of uh, <laughs> Angel Lust Magazine? <laughs> Eventually, Bertrand got the lower half of the body uncovered, which he repeatedly hacked at with a knife. Before long, Bertrand was digging up bodies and cutting off pieces for later masturbation purposes. Mm. And to satisfy his self-described erotic compulsion, he was soon breaking into one of the most famous cemeteries on Earth, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to in my life, Per Lachaise Cemetery. God, you know, you just go into those, it's just like breaking the Louvre just to fuck a painting. (laughs) You know, just to come on a hot dog. That almost almost like, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It does. That's right. No. But this is what I'm saying. Like, it's interesting that he started with mutilations. Like, mm-hmm. mutilations are how it got. He just would see a dead body and stab it a bunch with a knife, and then he'd get horny from that, and then he'd go masturbate. Yeah. And then he was just taking off chunks. Mm-hmm. Started taking off chunks. But much like Ed Gein, Bertrand claimed that the grave digging was never premeditated. He would never say, like, I'm going to go dig a grave on Thursday. i got to clear up my schedule. Mm -hmm. Instead, he said that when the attack got possession of him, whether it be noon or midnight, he had to go. It was, in his words, impossible to postpone the urge. Yeah, he was like Ryan Styles. (laughs) How is he like Ryan Styles? Improv. (laughs) Oh, improv. (laughs) Oh, improv. Yeah, he's making it up, man. Yeah. (laughs) Shout out to Ryan Styles. Yeah, what's going on? Love you, you, Ryan. You're great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) I don't know if you fuck corpses. You're Scandinavian. But if you did, I'd let you get away with it because you're that funny. One time. Yeah. You get one. But you get to pick it. (laughs) 
<laughs> Let me be clear. I am the president of the United States. I will not be fucked by Ryan Stiles. <laughs> <laughs> but in Per La Chaise, Bertrand dug up the corpse of a 40-year-old woman, disemboweled it, and cut the entrails into, quote, a thousand pieces. Every night for two weeks, Bertrand returned to Per La Chaise to dig up and mutilate bodies until he reached orgasm. Then he would rebury the body so no one would be the wiser. I'm always very curious in those moments after because, you know, like when I jerk off, it's like, you know, three minutes of flurry and then it's over. And then it's like, oh, you know, like, ugh, what have I done? And you're like, all right, I'm bit, move on with my day. Mm -hmm. Like you've cut open a, a you've dug open a, a grave mm -hmm. in a very mm -hmm. fancy cemetery. Yeah. You've cut up a woman's entrails in a bunch. I mean, you're, you're in that. You're probably going like, ah! <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. And then you jerk it off. And then you go, oh, go, go, go. Uh, 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 le merci, Birk. <laughs> he comes. And then you're just like, well, <laughs> is that it? Like, what do you do? What do you do? You for get that to, day? you put the dirt back Ugh. on the grave. All right. Well, Francois, you did it again. <laughs> like, is it just that? You're like, it's like when a kid plays with their toys too much and then you got to make them put it away as a lesson. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> just like that. Yes. Yeah, just like that. No, he was uh, unrepentant. Yeah. Come to the end. It's like, ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think I would imagine he would see it as uh, the same as you feel after a, a, a good meal. Okay. Nice full belly. Mm. And then, you know, take right. a nap. Take yeah, a nap. Yeah, go, you're yeah. taking a get yeah. all tuckered out. Oh, well, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Finally, though, Bertrand's reign at Per La Chaise came to an end when he drank too much and fell asleep at the cemetery. A guard discovered him and took a shot with his pistol, but Bertrand was able to escape. That place was kind of off limits after that. Now, by the next year, Bertrand became overwhelmed with the desire to actually have sex with a corpse, which was an urge that he had thus far withstood. And so he began digging up women of all ages, from old ladies all the way down to toddlers. But it must be said that after Bertrand dug up a three-year-old, he realized that he did indeed have a line. So he reburied the corpse without defiling it. You know what? Honestly, right now... <laughs> This is gross. <laughs> I did not see until now, but this is gross. All right, all right. You coming for you, Brenda. <laughs> now, from August to November in the year 1848, Bertrand disinterred and defiled 15 corpses. When he couldn't find the fresh corpse of a woman, though, he'd dig up a man instead, only to angrily slash and stab at the body without masturbating. Wow. Well, Seems like he's more of a digger than anything. I just yeah. don't understand. They got tombstones. Yeah. They tell you what's in them. But it's got to be a fresh one. Ah. Yeah. You got to look around. You got to see the fresh, you know, you got to see and the sometimes dirt sometimes they mounds. won't have a tombstone if it's fresh, honestly, because sometimes they are carving it and then they drop it in later on. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But much like a serial killer, Bertrand's methods became more brutal and experimental as time went on. He began splitting the mouths of corpses, cutting their bodies into ribbons, pulling the limbs out of the sockets, and twisting the bodies into grotesque shapes in an attempt to thoroughly destroy the cadaver. Finally, though, Bertrand's frequent visits to the cemetery got noticed, and in March of 1849, after three years of digging up corpses, authorities set up a trap at Montparnasse Cemetery to ensnare their mysterious ghouls. Just a fucking a freshly filled in grave, but just a butt yeah. <laughs> hanging out of the top of it. <laughs> like how they bury their uh, dead in Poland because they have a place to park their bikes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Well, Sergeant Francois Bertrand was shot and taken to the hospital where he confessed everything. He was quickly charged and found guilty of vampirism, which soon after came to be known as necrophilia. It, wasn't this the case that got it to be known as necrophilia? I believe so. Although yeah. I don't know if the dates match up because I think it was, I have to look at 1848. Yes, it was. It was absolutely the one that they looked at. It's like, no, we need, we need, we got to call this something else. This is something else. <laughs> His last words were, if I die. Please fuck me. <laughs> that would be incredible. <laughs> Use my mouth. He was jailed for one year yep. and became a lighthouse keeper after his release. Honestly, the, that is perfect. That is the job. <laughs> yeah, that is yeah. the perfect. job. Yeah. Now, several psychiatrists and criminologists have worked for years to help classify necrophilia. Although, admittedly, as you said, like it's about a paper a decade. It's about a paper a decade. It's not, it doesn't generate a lot of like research funding. Yeah. But Anil Agrawal, 
author of the Necrophilia textbook, aggregated all the studies available to create an in-depth, 10-level classification system. God, we just need to teach our necrophilia class somewhere yeah. Yeah. set it up. <laughs> Imagine, like, having to tell your children what your book was about. <laughs> Do you know, hey, Brian, do you know that there's 10 different ways to fuck a corpse? Eventually, I'm going to have to do that. Oh, yeah, you I will. wrote a fucking disgusting book. Yeah. It's absolutely foul. Yeah, yeah. it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, no. I can't wait. No, the, all, all of our friends who have kids, they're going to listen to everything we've ever said. Yeah. 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 I'll tell them. Cool. Great. <laughs> yeah. Let Uncle Andy sit you down. Yeah. No, I think my brother actually hides his copy of our book like in a special secret place so his children can't see it. That was the goal. Yeah, yeah exactly. Agrawal, however, makes an important distinction between genuine necrophilia and pseudo-necrophilia. For posers. <laughs> Pseudo-necrophiles... That is an te actual technical term, pseudo-necrophilia. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Pseudo-necrophiles have a transient attraction to a corpse, yeah. but are not actually attracted to the corpse itself. Yeah. Oh, you fuck corpses? Name three. <laughs> Oh. Mm. <laughs> Instead, they like their partner to merely pretend they're dead. Which brings us to the class one necrophile. Role players. Barely make it to the fucking classification yeah, system. Yeah, this is fine. Yeah, but that's why they're class one. Yeah. yeah. It's weird. They're responsible about it. Well, do yeah. you ever do that thing? I do it with Natalie sometimes where I pretend to be dead until she gets scared and mad. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. do that. But she doesn't get, if she got horny and jumped on me, I mean, again, I'd take it. Yeah. But then afterwards we'd talk. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you'd have a yeah. frank conversation about <laughs> what's but then, happening. But it'd probably be more like, so if I just do this, Any, I get laid every time. Anytime. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, well, are you going to make that trade? <laughs> Man goes from. It's kind of romantic, though. Get one more in before you get all soupy. I say this to Natalie all the time. I'll pretend to be dead. I was like, just play with my balls one last time. She's just like, she gets all upset. Yeah. <laughs> God, you know, God damn it. These fucking women. <laughs> I don't fucking understand it. Well, these people will ask their partners to play dead by painting their face to look like a corpse. That's a lot. They'll cover themselves in a plastic sheet while wearing a toe tag. Or they ask them to take baths in ice water prior to sex to give themselves that old-fashioned corpse coldness. Okay. Others have what's known as the sleeping beauty fantasy, yeah. in which sex brings the quote-unquote dead lover back to life. That's the original story of sleeping beauty. She got railed while she was asleep, and then she was pregnant while she was asleep, and mm -hmm. then the, she popped open when she fucking... Yeah. <laughs> this is also discussed in the song The Monster Mash, to a certain extent, wherein the narrator's monster is brought back to life through the soul power of the mash. Through, yeah, through mashing it. <laughs> mash <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> but again, no, when it's suddenly, not the to mash. my surprise, uh, yeah, he did the mash, but the monster mash again, we have to remind our audience, is not the monster mash. It is a song about the monster mash. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the song, they don't know they talk about the monster mash, but the song itself is not the monster mash. The song is, it's titled The Monster Mash. No, it's about the monster mash. Now, what about when uh, the <laughs> Frankenstein's monster fucks Bride of Frankenstein? How would you classify that? Because they're both dead. That's uh, love. I think he was, was gay. <laughs> Frankenstein's monster was gay. They actually never touched. She wasn't into it. Oh, really? You remember the scene? I've never seen it. Frankenstein, honestly, Bride of Frankenstein is one of my favorite horror movies of all movie. time. Really? It's yeah. great. No, it's fantastic. But Frankenstein's monster had more of a tender, emotional, maybe physical connection with the blind man okay. that he met. And he, the blind man who fed him, there's a lot of talk about how that was a gay love scene. They were having sex in that scene. Hmm. Bride of Frankenstein never wanted to have anything to do with Frankenstein's monster. She was just born mad, like a lot of ladies. Okay. Nah. For this class one fetish, is it always harmless? Nor is it always practiced by harmless people? The worst example is Joseph Fritzl. Mm. Fritzels, pretzels. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Fritzels, they, pretzels. And you know what? That company loves that. <laughs> they, they, they love that. They have that immediate. They love that. Yeah. yeah, Fritzel was the guy who held his daughter captive for 24 years and produced seven children with her. I remember. Yeah, you remember. <laughs> <laughs> you remember. Yeah, you remember. Fritzl is technically a class one necrophile because he would hire sex workers to pretend they were dead during the transaction. Mm. But while class one necrophiles are all about sex, class two necrophiles are defined by their emotional attachments. These are the so-called romantic necrophiles, also known as necromaniacs. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
These people can't bear separation from their loved ones and often refuse to accept that their wife or lover is actually dead. Sometimes these people will clothe the corpse of their loved one, move them from room to room throughout the day, and prop them up for normal activities like eating dinner or watching TV. Interestingly, though, romantic necrophiles rarely have sex with the corpses they keep. Probably because the actual sexual act will more so remind you that the person is dead. It'll dispel yeah. the fantasy. Yeah, where I think that this is, this is the one, <laughs> if there's one of these I vaguely understand, Yeah, it's yeah. this concept of you don't want to let them go, and so you just kind of try to press on like everything's normal by dressing up a corpse. This yeah. is Mary Jane's last dance, Yes. Right? yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, Tom Petty was a grave digger, by the way. Was he? Yeah, before he was uh, in, in Gainesville, he was a grave digger. Oh, really? Oh, was, there, was there someone else who's a grave digger? Wasn't like Danny DeVito or like some famous actor? Harrison Ford might was, have been. Harrison he Ford was a, was a carpenter. carpenter. Was it Kevin Bacon? No. Too handsome. He's too nice. Yeah, he's too tiny. Yeah, too. he's small. Yeah, you got to have long arms. Yeah, it's got to be like John Candy Ooh. or something. John Stewart was a grave digger. Rod, Rod Stewart. Rod Stewart. <laughs> that From the sense. faces? Thank you. And he's tiny. Yeah, he is tiny. Yeah. yeah. He looks like a grandmother now. <laughs> <laughs> he does, but have you seen his little, his new little shuffle dance? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Still has one of the best voices in rock and roll. Go listen Absolutely. to some early faces stuff. Oh my it's God, fantastic. and Jeff Beck. Yeah. 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 I don't like it. It's great. Rod Stewart's very, he's not just, if you think I'm sexy, there's a lot more to Rod Stewart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I he's like John very... Fogarty better. Ugh. Ugh. He's got a very Robert Plant voice. We're yeah. getting too much. Into yeah, well, he does have a very Robert. And there's a, I'll, well, I'll sort talk of like to you later. Ripping him off. Yeah, talk, kind of like he was ripping him off. I'll talk to you later about Terry Reed. He's the missing link between all this. It's fantastic. You, you're going to, you're going to lose your mind when you listen to this guy. Hell yeah. I yeah. Love it. Oh, Bone yeah. on the bayou. <laughs> Bone on the bayou. <laughs> the midnight special is when you fuck a corpse. Though. Yes. <laughs> That's when you order it <laughs> from Instagram. <laughs> One of the more interesting examples of a romantic necrophile is an eccentric British aristocrat named Sir John Price, who hails from the mid-18th century. After his first wife died, his cousin, by the way, he had her embalmed and kept her in his bed even after he remarried. See, while the first wife was of aristocratic stock, the second was a local farmer's daughter who was kept a secret from the rest of the aristocracy. The power imbalance meant that wife number two had to put up with the dead body of wife number one while sleeping and having sex in her marital bed. I'll just you get... said none of these guys were charming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 you are disturbing, Beryl. You're disturbing her. Keep your knees close to me when you're riding me. <laughs> but when the second wife died, some say of shame, Sir Price embalmed her as well, and he slept between the two corpses, or should I say betwixt. Now, that's a lot of bed. I got two dogs and a wife in the bed, and I'm already clinging mm -hmm. to one side, a very corner of it. I can't imagine having two dead women in there. Wow. Well, I would imagine two dogs equals one dead woman. No. <laughs> I'm talking volume wise. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. This, this episode really shows the, the very small but gulf. There are gulfs in between us, you know? <laughs> Imagine like the dog just like running off with your ex wife's foot. Just, I can see it. But when Sir John Price married his third wife, she insisted that he remove the corpses before she would agree to marry him. Yeah. One source says he refused and she reported him for his crimes, but another that is backed up by documentation says that he agreed to get rid of the bodies. He did not, however, let go of wife number three when she died as well. Oh, she knew that was coming. Yeah, well, I mean, this is different, though. Because then it's kind of out of jealousy. It's a little bit different what he did with his third wife. I, well, I don't. What do you mean? A little. He wanted her to get rid of the fuck. It, he wanted. She wanted him to get rid of the corpses out of jealousy. Yeah. Do you think it's out of jealousy? You love these corpses so much. Why didn't you marry him? Oh, you did, and they died. Well, there. It's fucking over. When she <laughs> married him, he had the corpses in his bed. Yeah, yeah, she knew. Yeah, I guess that's what it is. She, she knew. You knew. Was, she knew what was up. But that's well, the thing. Never get into a relationship with somebody expecting to change them. Yeah, that's and right. Also, like. Is no one talking about this guy's probably killing his wives? No. Oh, back no. in the, I mean, this is like the, this is the 1700s. Oh, yeah, mid 1700s. People just, people just willy nilly. Fight. It's not, like, you know, common. It's not uncommon for a man to have three dead wives. Yeah, you sprain your ankle, you die. Yeah. 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 But when this third wife died, Sir Price wrote a letter to a well known faith healer named Bridget Bostock, AKA the Cheshire Pythoness. 
He invited her to his estate. For the- I wouldn't invite her. <laughs> Your name's the Cheshire Pythoness. Cheshire Pythoness. I don't know if I want you in my home. Yeah, it's like the Cheshire cat, but like a giant snake. A giant yeah. snake? That's, That's fucking t- awesome. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think about it. He invited her to his estate for the purpose of resurrecting his third wife. This was, of course, unsuccessful. Mm. And Sir Price finally died himself in 1761. Stab her pussy again! Stab her! This inability to let go, however, is not limited to men. And make of this what you will, but class two necrophiles are the group that contains the highest percentage of women amongst their ranks. Because the romantic contingent. Yes. As a way to, I suppose, never be apart from their deceased husbands, two women in the 18th century, one French and one Belgian, cut off the penises of their dead husbands and carried the phalluses around as treasured relics in expensive cases. The Belgian chose a silver case, while the French chose gold. I'm putting this in my will. Yeah, yeah, honestly. (laughs) But, like, that's a lot of love for a cock. And when it comes to husband cock, it's not always the biggest and best cock you ever had. No. But it's hopefully the last. It's the most loving cock. It's the one that's attached to the guy that you're into. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's the cock of love. Yeah. Because I don't want to know the old ones. No. (laughs) No, I'm not asking about those. No. Cock of love makes you feel good. Yeah. (laughs) Another example is the case of Joanna of Castile, a.k.a. Joanna the Mad, who is, interestingly, the older sister of Henry VIII's first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Wow, that is interesting. It's incredibly interesting. She's such a, <laughs> she's a massive character in British history. Wow. And this is her older sister. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating, no matter what you say. Joanna the Mad's husband, Philip the Handsome, died of typhus at the age of 28 in 1506. Instead of burying him, though, she kept the body for a year, pretending he was merely asleep in his casket. She would talk to him as though he were alive, complimenting him on said handsomeness, while forcing her servants to treat him as if he was a living being. It says Joanna the Mad, but it's more like Joanna the Extremely Traumatized. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, while Class two necrophiles are all about emotional connection, Class three necrophiles, necrophilic fantasizers, are where we get back to purely sexual motivations. Just the interviews this author had to do and just sit and talk about all this. I'd be like, did you fuck it? How deep? You use your fingers? You use your mouth? You use your penis? No, you get a questionnaire and you have them fill it out. Yeah. These necrophiles will masturbate to pictures of dead bodies and sometimes even manage to masturbate at funerals. They are, however, the necrophile most likely to escalate. Yeah, because that sounds like, to be honest, this sounds like this is just, it's a baby necrophile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this is the first step towards becoming a true necrophile. I do want to pay several people to jerk off at my funeral because they're just so sad. <laughs> yeah. They want to get one last go in. We got to get a lawyer in here and do our wills one day. Yeah, I can't. I've been thinking about that a long time about doing a long form series where we have a lawyer make up all of our wills for each other. That's a great way to do it for free, or at least have the business pay for it. Yeah, yep. business expense. Oh, yeah. Boy, you're, you're thinking like a businessman nowadays. Especially when it comes to our eventual deaths. <laughs> <laughs> well, one interesting case that stayed in fantasy land involved a necrophilic blind man whose desire to kill a woman to obtain a corpse only grew as he aged, but that desire was stymied by the obvious obstacles that prevented him from doing so. That's why I feel like it's, it's nice now, because it's probably much more able for a blind man to kill a woman to have sex with her corpse. <laughs> yeah. You can't play Marco Polo with a corpse. <laughs> also, with your stick, you don't know where she is because yeah. well, you need this for her to go like, ow. Yeah. Yeah. Although this may fly in the face of my smell theory. Yeah. yeah. That- <laughs> <laughs> well, Literally, who lose one sense, you know, could lose another. Yeah, like Daredevil. It's like he lost the power of sight, but now all he wants to do is fuck corpses <laughs> and save New York and be Catholic and a lawyer. <laughs> and he's so guilty about all of so it. Guilty. <laughs> well, this blind man's fantasies mostly revolved around breasts and included sucking quote cream from breasts and biting breasts open to find a quote unlimited flow of creamy milk. His necrophilic fantasies were even more bizarre, involving a baby suckling at a dead woman's breast that would burst open (laughs) and swallow the child. Marcus, do you want cranberry sauce? (laughs) Uh, We have this, your grandmother made this delicious gravy. We just love that you're in town. You know what this gravy reminds me of? (laughs) We were so close to like losing the thought of this man from Earth until you just brought it up. (laughs) 
<laughs> he almost faded into obscurity. Like he almost finally just left. Because that's when you actually die, when no one remembers your name anymore. Yeah. And now this man is gonna live until the fucking solar flare wipes out the, the internet. internet. <laughs> Strangely, though, because this blind man could never hope to kill a woman or even obtain a corpse for himself, he began fantasizing about a more realistic goal. Oh, good. Instead of a human, he began to fantasize about killing and or obtaining the corpse of a horse. Horses show up a lot. Yeah, it's weird. Why not sheep? I think horses because there's more meat. I think it's because they're bigger. Yeah, they're bigger. I guess. And they got huge. I mean, he liked women. I guess they had huge tits when they have milk. Well, there's also dead horses. Like, fuck it. Everywhere in the olden times. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess it's the slower in the bar. Yeah. It's like when you stay at the bar. The, you know, until 4 a.m. and it's whoever's there. And it's, at the end, it's a fucking it's horse, a horse corpse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a horse walks into a bar, <laughs> he dies and gets fucked by a blind man. That's the end of the joke. <laughs> Where did I get this joke book? <laughs> Dad, I found this in your room. <laughs> Mark there says, why the long dick? <laughs> But logically, if we're making small steps here, the next thing to do after fantasizing about fucking a corpse is to actually touch a corpse, which brings us to class four, the tactile necrophile. These necrophiles touch, stroke, or lick dead bodies to obtain full release, but never go further than that. I would never (laughs) fuck a corpse. (laughs) I just pick its nose. I play with its tits a little bit. Yeah, sure. But I would never fuck it. You just touch it. You stroke it. This is where you find your mortuary attendants, your EMTs, your volunteer firefighters. This is where you always yeah. fuck. <laughs> this is where we find our I'm brave not. volunteer firefighters. <laughs> well, it's basically anyone who's in fleeting proximity to dead bodies. That's where we get, you know, we were talking earlier about the EMTs. But they're only in the presence of a dead body for a short period of time. So that's where you get the, the touch, touch, and so yeah. on and so then forth. And you throw them in the van, shut the door, and... Yep. Shut the blinds. Yes. Is that nice? That yeah. does happen. Yeah. 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 Quite unfortunate, but it does happen. Remember that. I don't know. I'm dead. Who cares? But, but some we'll tactile necrophiles then. actually believe that since they go no further than touch, they're really not doing any harm at all. And they should be accepted for their desires. No. <laughs> Answers no. <laughs> Answers no. It's a hard no. You Across know, again, the board, a hard no. Again, unless it's, I will, we'll talk about this when we do our wills. It must be written in documentation of go ahead fuck that corpse yeah or yeah. touch that corpse yeah you could touch my dick and balls if that's what you want yeah i mean if you go to a funeral and technically anybody who goes to the funeral can touch the corpse i mean it might be frowned upon if you're a stranger but you can touch any corpse you want yeah there's no law against touching a corpse at you're a one of those guys that was like can i or may i uh- <laughs> <laughs> oh i can do it <laughs> you should be asking should <laughs> should i <laughs> <laughs> Again, depends on the funeral. <laughs> but while tactile necrophiles are a plenty in professional situations, including medical students who get erections while dissecting cadavers, some are regular Joes who have to get their kicks at, as I said, funerals. Mm. One man who went by the initials WR to maintain anonymity hmm. said that he would follow obituaries, get dressed up in his Sunday best, and attend funerals where he might be able to see a dead body and maybe get in a touch or two so he could masturbate to the memory. You know they must have had armed guards around Anna Nicole Smith's body. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. You guys going like, huh, like it's the offensive line. You know, you see people like, hey, what? Hey, what? <laughs> Can't jump the line and scream it. <laughs> But while W.R. did claim that he would never engage in necrocoitus because he knew it was wrong. Oh, yeah. He did admit after much prodding that he did fantasize about killing if the funerals in town were running a bit low that month. See, this is the problem. It's not the it's, you know, again, dress somebody up, put him in a bunch of ice. You know, like, play with them like they're corpse, but they're alive and everybody's agreeing on it. You know, it's hard to get someone to agree to that. It is. Yeah. Now, sex dolls, wouldn't they be, like, a good, like, substitute? No. That's where he was. (laughs) God, there was a whole spread on the Christmas issue last year of Angel Lust Magazine. But it's because they're not filled with blood and, and, and cum and shit. Well, it's not real because yeah. part of it is the transgression. Of course, you know that's, like, that's what makes it a paraphilia, right? Yeah. What about taxidermy? 
Like a taxidermied person with a fleshlight in them. It's actually yeah. extremely difficult to get that going, though. Well, we'll get to that later. Okay. It's cool. very it's illegal to taxidermy a person. You can't do that. <laughs> yep. No. It's but, another way. St- but it's still legal to fuck them in 10 states. It's just another way, man. Another way that our freedoms are held down. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on the more extreme side of things when it comes to tactile necrophiles was a 30-year-old sales clerk who went by the initial D. His thing was fellating corpses. Now, there was something about abnormal fellation with this guy because before corpses, he would fellate bulls, or so he claimed. Now, that's actually more of a stretch than anything for me personally because yeah. I know from experience that bulls are quite a handful even when you're not trying to fellate them. He may, however, have had access to tame bulls who might not have minded the activity. <laughs> That's the only way this would have worked. <laughs> well, at some point, if you're getting your dick sucked across the animal kingdom, <laughs> yeah, but the, you begin to calm down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the thing. You got to get cl- The bull doesn't know you're going in to fillet it. And also, uh, most animals don't have sex for pleasure. So it, it's, to him, it's nothing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How big was his mouth? <laughs> uh, well, a bull cock is not that... <laughs> It's not as big not, as you think it is. It's not as big as you think it is. It's not a, like a horse cock. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, this is the reason why we say horse cock instead of bull cock. <laughs> yeah, you know? good point. Or donkey dick. Wait, donkey bull dick, cock yeah. sounds yeah. gross. Yeah, bull cock sounds real awful. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. horse cock. Sign me up. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, cow yeah. dick. Well, yeah, weird. Ugh. Cow dick is what you call a guy who's like fucking animals. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a whole fashioned cow dick. I'm like horse cock <laughs> is my uncle Kevin. Yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Not a man in your family. Not a man in your family. No, we are Irish Scottish. <laughs> but when it came to corpses, D initially had a fear of dead bodies until someone suggested that he could cure his fear through immersion therapy, i.e. touching a corpse. That, however, kicked off a whole new avenue of fellatio for our young subject. Can you even believe <laughs> how many different ways I can suck dick? <laughs> <laughs> well, after realizing that fellating corpses was his thing, he started hanging around a mortuary so he could slowly gain the trust of the undertaker. Ugh. I feel bad for the undertaker. Yeah. Once he made friends, this guy got access and he regularly began putting the floppy members of dead men into his mouth until he was finally caught and sentenced to three years in prison. I must oh. tell you, D, I have never met anyone else so enthusiastic about the science of the dead. And I... Oh my God, D. <laughs> You're just sucking the dicks. I told you to do their makeup and put metal rods in their spine. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This, this is, is a corkscrew. You must put it into the anus, anus to keep all of the fluids from leaking. Oh, you're and sucking upsetting his dick. the family. That's disgusting. <laughs> I feel so bad for him. Undertaker just, he thought he made a friend. It's so hard for Undertakers to make friends. I imagine so. Oh, yeah, because everywhere you go, doors open without you touching them. And then there's always like, ding, 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 like organ music playing. Now, if you doubted my earlier statement that necrophilia is far more complicated and nuanced than what we've been led to believe, keep in mind that we're about to talk about the fifth class of necrophiles, and we still haven't even gotten a penetrative sex. Yeah, we're yeah. at the G of the Roy G. Big <laughs> of the rainbow of necrophiles. <laughs> Class fives are the fetishistic necrophiles, although the definition of fetish in this case is not its most popular usage. Instead, this is a fetish as an object, okay. specifically a body part that has been removed from a corpse for sexual purposes. Yeah, so they just like the little chunks. Yeah, That's the what the, the other guy was slowly graduating through. Yep. These necrophiles will cut off fingers, breasts, or they pop out an eyeball for later usage. Some of them even go as far as they shave and they save a corpse's pubic hair. That should be allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Someone what, made what grandma do it. Wait a second. Someone made grandma look sexy? <laughs> <laughs> it is, however, important to keep in mind that in order to be a class five, the corpse has to be already dead from something other than a necrophile's own hand when the necrophile mutilates it. Because then it's just mutilating a corpse. Jerry Brudos, for example, shoots right past class five because even though he did remove breasts and keep them as fetish objects, he killed the women whose breasts he removed. Yeah, this is not about, this is not farm to table. No. This is you're going to the store. This is foraging. This is foraging. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Harm to table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from your grave. But the most interesting fetishistic necrophile is a man who, yes, did have sex with corpses, but did not choose body parts for his fetish object. Instead, Jean-Baptiste of Salt Lake City collected burial clothes from the corpses that he'd already buried once in the course of his job as the local grave digger. 
Now, the evidence for Jean Baptiste being a penetrative necrophile is circumstantial, but one can extrapolate from how his fetish was discovered that he probably did engage in sexual intercourse with at least one corpse before he was caught. Yeah. See, for about three years in the late 19th century, Jean Baptiste was a devout Mormon. He'd been recruited by missionaries in Australia and had been brought to America on an LDS immigration ship. Mormons used to do that all the time. They'd go out to Australia, England, wherever. They'd get a bunch of people together like, hey, you want to go to America? Great. You can do it for free. You just got to become a Mormon and go to this place called Utah. Because remember yeah. they did that big time in the UK. Yeah. They did, UK yeah. was big, but they also apparently did it in Australia. Wow. Well, once arrived and established in Salt Lake City, Jean Baptiste became acting choir leader for his ward, and he moved into a small house near the cemetery after he was hired as a grave digger. And then he eventually graduated from working for Stephen Colbert. <laughs> <laughs> but this also put him closer to the objects of his affection. Now, Jean-Baptiste Fetish might have remained a secret forever had it not been for a criminal with the ridiculous name of Moroni Clausen. Man, that is just, that's big, like, that's, pressure well, that's to be big, named Moroni. That's it's, big Mormon energy. Yes, yeah. like being na- it's like being named Jesus Christ Sullivan. <laughs> Or I'm an idiot. Moron I? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know about, do you know about Moroni? No. Mor- he's, yeah, he's yeah. the guy that delivered Mormonism to Joseph Smith. Yeah, oh, he's, okay. yeah he's the guy that brought the, the golden plates to, to Joseph Smith. He's a, he's a major, major figure in Mormonism. Okay, cool. Yeah, he's like the second G. Like he's it's like a ghost. Number two behind Jesus. He's not real. Yeah. Oh, it's not real. No, no, no. No, 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 no. No, he's not. In 1862, Moroni and another man were accused of beating up the governor of Utah. That's awesome. (laughs) Wow. You could get to him back then. Yeah, you really could. And Moroni was shot and killed by police in the ensuing chase. But since nobody came forward in Salt Lake City to give Moroni a proper burial, the policeman, who I assume was responsible for Moroni's death, an officer named Heath, agreed to pay for both the burial and a new suit for Moroni to take to the afterlife. That's a gentleman. Yeah, it's generous. They're very generous. Very Mormon thing to do, I'd say, yeah. Not long after, though, Moroni Clausen's family in Draper, Utah, got word of his death, and they requested that the body be exhumed and moved to their family plot. Once the casket was unearthed, however... Clausen's family saw that not only was Moroni completely naked, but he was also facing down. Ah, yep. You know, take the time to flip him over. Just yeah. put the clothes back on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would imagine with this one, well, the it's clothes, like it's down there, you well, know? the clothes are, are all a part of it. But I'd imagine with this one, that w- this was probably a let's get it covered up. Uh, let me get my shame covered up as fast as possible. Oh, you don't want to spend the, anymore. Once he came. And yeah, then he once was just, he came. And he's, he's like, like, oh, oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Moroni's brother then went to complain to Officer Heath, whom he knew was responsible for the burial. And Heath was puzzled because he knew that Moroni had been buried in a suit that Heath had paid for himself. And I knew it was a special occasion, so I went down to the store and I got him a birthday suit. (laughs) (laughs) I don't understand. (laughs) So Heath and Moroni Clausen's brother went to the local gravedigger's home to see what was what. That gravedigger was, of course... John Baptiste. I have no idea what happened to his clothes. He's like wearing all of his clothes. I have no idea. Now, John was out digging a grave when the police arrived. But while questioning John's wife, Officer Heath noticed that there was a conspicuous amount of boxes containing soiled clothing stacked about the Baptiste living room. Upon closer examination, it became obvious that these were the clothes of the dead. It sounds like he just became a very, very gothic version of a reseller. Yeah, well, no, it's more of a hoarder. Yeah. Yeah, gothic hoarder. After counting the pieces of clothing, it was surmised that Jean Baptiste had robbed over 300 graves of their clothing. Now, there were no court records or newspaper articles concerning Jean Baptiste's punishment, but this was Salt Lake City during the reign of Brigham Young. And Young actually spoke about the Baptiste case during a sermon that think, was written down. Jesus Christ. I do think it's a lot of it's got, he's more mad about the stealing. Well, it was big news <laughs> yeah. in Salt Lake City. Like, this is a big, big deal. It's crazy how it's bigger than fighting the governor. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> they beat up the governor. <laughs> yeah. Well, apparently, the people of Salt Lake City wanted to hang Baptiste. Mm. But Young said that this would be too easy of a punishment. Yeah. And life in prison would likewise, quote, do nobody any good. So Young decided that the best punishment for Baptiste would be exile to a small island on the Great Salt Lake, where he would either survive or die. 
They just left him on an island? They just, but they exiled him to like he was fucking Napoleon. He's sitting on that island. <laughs> but like, is that it with the tent and shit? There was that house? They just put him out there and said, survive or die. But the problem with this punishment is that Fremont Island was being used by a family to graze their cattle. Yeah, it's at the middle of the Pacific. It's the middle of Utah. Yeah, yeah but it's a giant, so the Salt Lake is huge. Yeah, it's huge. Massive. It's huge. Yeah. And you need fresh water to live. Yeah, yeah. but. There was fresh water there. There was a small shack on the island stocked with basic provisions. Oh. Therefore, within six weeks, Jean-Baptiste, living off of these provisions, he dismantled the shack and used the hide of a heifer that he'd killed to build a raft. I gotta get back to these corpses. <laughs> <laughs> They're not gonna fuck themselves. <laughs> that raft then took Baptiste off Fremont Island. And while some claim that his skeleton was found the next year near the mouth of the Jordan River, Officer Heath had it on good authority that Baptiste had made his way to a mining camp in Montana, where he'd been heard bragging about his escape to the locals. Although... I do not know if he was bragging about why he was sent to the island. I think it's one of those where if you're in jail and you pull your card, you just go, ah, well, you know, it's, things got complicated. <laughs> you know? It's the prequel to Castaway. It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Different Wilson. <laughs> yeah, it's a severed fucking butt. This is Mr. Wilson. <laughs> Now, as yeah, we... my father's Mr. Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> now, as we progress along the necrophile classes, the bloodier the necrophiles are going to become. That brings us to class six, the one with the coolest fucking name. That's where we find our necromutilomaniacs. <laughs> This is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta work on my metal bass line. Yeah. No, it's funk. That's I'm getting funk. Into funk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stupid slap. This is exactly what it's. <laughs> <laughs> it needs rumble. It needs like yeah. I just think of Jason Newstead. Well, well, that's the thing is that most uh, metal bands, you know, the bass is turned pretty, you know, pretty far down. I actually like when metal ha has more bass, more pronounced. I like the m more pronounced bass as well. Oh yeah, there's this band that's doing some fucking awesome lo-fi stuff. They're called Poison Ruin. They got this uh, album called Harvest. So fucking good. I'm gonna look, get I'm gonna look anybody out there that's in Poison Ruin that listens to the fucking show, get a hold of us. I fucking I love what you do. Oh, yeah, yeah you fuck guys. yeah. Yeah. Well, necromutilomaniacs are exactly what they sound like. And while they are disturbing and violent, they again only commit these acts on cadavers that have died from some means other than murder at the necromutilomaniac's hand. You're doing good with the word. Thank you. I necromutilomaniac. I mean, it, it rolls off the tongue. It does. Ne because, well, what you got to do, you got to make a little song of it, like necromutilomaniac, <laughs> necromutilomaniac. <laughs> I, I did that for quite a long time yesterday. Marcus, you want some pumpkin pie? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we all love that. You know, we just love your successful in Los Angeles. <laughs> Domo arigato <laughs> necromutilomaniac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Domo arigato necromutilomaniac. I can't do it. Well, the worst of these that I read about was again in France. There, a young man discovered the dead body of his mother after her sudden death. Almost immediately, he had sexual intercourse with the body, then pushed his arm deep inside through the vagina. He broke through to her abdominal cavity where he grabbed onto a handful of intestines and pulled out two meters worth. <laughs> he then... <laughs> <laughs> it's a mom mower. Yeah. <laughs> he then went back in and grabbed the liver amongst other various organs and parts. Oh, you're not going to want to forget the liver. <laughs> <laughs> After this blood orgy of destruction, the subject then got a bit tuckered out and he fell asleep wrapped in his mother's intestines. When he woke up, he was quite stupefied, in his words, over what he'd Ooh. done. And while he was examined by a doctor, he was never charged with a crime, nor was he ever confined to an asylum. They just were like, all right, you can't do this again. <laughs> I only got one mother. <laughs> How am I ever going to do this I again? I only got one mother. Me. Yeah, what am I going to do? What do you want? Now, do you think he loved her too much or not at all? Uh, too much. I'd say too much. Yeah. 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 If you're falling asleep wrapped in your mother's intestines. Yeah. Yeah. You're gonna you're gonna have some Ed Gein vibes. Because that's why they gave him a pass. Yeah, I think so. They've been like, well, he loves his mother. Well, I think the the memory. They figure like maybe the memory of what he's done is gonna be bad enough. You gotta I live mean, with that. Take some pictures. You know, so he sees. Mm -hmm. Kind of what you're looking like right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Now, this guy is absolutely a class six, but he could also be put into class seven, that of the opportunistic necrophile. These are people who like having sex with the living, but would absolutely have sex with a corpse if given the chance. Uh, These whoa. are your world-class perverts. Oh, yeah. This is the anything goes group. Your Duchovny's. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> David Duchovny, the David Duchovny of necrophilia. <laughs> and this includes who else but disgraced UK media personality and all-around monster, Sir Jimmy Savile. Now, we've been begged many times to do a series on Jimmy Savile. And I think that's going to be a case of be careful what you wish for. But one yeah. day I do want to do it, but it is rough. It's real rough. And for those of you who don't know, because Eddie didn't know who Jimmy Savile was before the show, yeah. it is important to know, remember, Jimmy Savile was an extremely popular media personality in the UK up until his death into 2011. A cultural institution. Yes, yeah. he was huge. He had a show called Jimmy Will Fix It. Where, Jim Will Fix Jim It. Jim Will Fix It, where he would, you know, kids would come on and he would, they would have some extravagant wish and he'd make it real. He also was like, deeply involved in the UK's government. He had all of these various charitable associations. He was everywhere. And then it turned out he was an absolutely rampant, sadistic pedophile. Every yeah. single thing that he did was all feeding into his sexual deviancy. Yes. Everything. But now, what we now have discovered, all of these fun, cheeky-ass jokes that he made about all of these things that he did, now you kind of relook at stuff and you're like, oh, he might have been absolutely serious. Well, he was hiding in plain sight the entire time. He yes. was absolutely serious. And, and But that's the thing is that people still knew. I mean, hell, back in like, I think it was like 1978, 79, like Johnny Rotten went on the oh, BBC yeah. and said like, you guys know Jimmy Savile's like a horrific monster, right? He's a pedophile. He got banned from the BBC for years from that. Again, Crazy. He was important. He knew the fucking queen. Yeah, he was a it's sir. our second night on this. Yeah. yeah yes. A, oh, yeah. We, we, we dog in the French, but this is our second <laughs> night. That's just what I'm saying, man. <laughs> Europe has got some, it's got some tastes. Mm -hmm. Well, Savile told hospital staff at Broadmoor Hospital where he, quote unquote, volunteered. And this is an example of him like saying, just saying shit and people only later realizing, like, oh, he was being serious. Or he might have been. I mean, who knows? But he was definitely was in the guise, under the guise that he was joking. He's mm -hmm. joking. He's a funny guy. He told them that he posed with corpses in lewd positions, took selfies with them, and stole their jewelry. He also had a really horrific Christmas song called Jingle Jangle Jewelry. That's what we were doing at the top. Yeah, that yeah. Was, that's yeah, that's what we were doing at the top. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Up, come and suck me clinkers. Yeah, come and suck me clinkers. Choke up your me chicken ch up me Charlie Hole. Lovely, yeah. lovely Jingle Jangle jewelry time to chuck your muck yeah. over your sister's jubblies yeah chucking your muck i think is uh, coming it's it's the worst uh euphemism for coming that yeah, i've ever heard sister's in my life. tits yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's real bad. christmas song you know the uh, it's cold out <laughs> <laughs> give me some nice warm goo <laughs> come on See, Savile was friends with the chief mortician at the Leeds General Infirmary Mortuary, and that mortician gave Savile unsupervised access to the dead for 20 years. Oh, my God. One nurse claimed that Savile would sometimes perform oral sex on corpses, an act that Savile disgustingly called... Gamarouche. So he sucked enough corpse dick to have a nickname for it. No, he just called oral sex in general Gamarouche. Oh, yeah. And do you yeah. think he was sucking dick or eating them out? He was eating them out. That's pretty common amongst necrophiles. They start with the cunnilingus. Okay, yeah. Yeah, they just bury the fucking faces right in there. Why do I feel like hmm, that I'd like, end with cunnilingus? You end with cunnilingus? Because it's feel already like, filled with your cum. Yeah. Which, well, it depends on what you do. I, I just... Yeah. That, so you would end it in cunnilingus. Do you not feel that cunnilingus is a more intimate exercise than just penetrative sex? I feel like it is. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, would, I feel would... like just going deep, nose deep into a fucking dead woman's corpse, into her vagina, is like not is more intense than fucking. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Touching boobies is probably the first way. First, the, the, the morning. Yeah, that's where you, yeah, you start with that. I imagine that's where everyone goes. <laughs> No, I like to bathe my corpse. If it was they left me alone. <laughs> no, I like to bathe her in milk and I brush her hair and then I play the violin for a couple oh, hours. Oh, yeah, like, you'd be like an Egyptian. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There was, there is. I will dispel a rumor. Some there is, there was a rumor going around that you know ancient Egyptians used to have a uh, ritual uh, to keep you know the embalmers from having sex with the dead. Yeah. Uh, 
they would just make sure, like, okay, let them decompose for a few days uh, before you really get let the embalmers around them because sometimes they'll, you know, they'll fuck the dead. But that's not true. That's like having a yeah, creepy uncle yeah, where you're yeah. like, yeah, don't let the kids near Uncle Peter, but he's hilarious. Yeah, no. they used to fuck the cats. The Egyptians, you're saying, I don't think they ever fucked the cats. <laughs> Side stories, think- LPOTL at gmail.com. Can ancient <laughs> Egyptians fuck cats? If our, any of our Egyptologists they worship out them. there. They I know worship they worship them. them. Yeah. But I don't know if they fuck them. I don't, I don't, hmm. I don't know if we can tell. We'll I don't find- know if it's any any hieroglyphics out there. Yeah. We'll find out. Another witness said that Saffo <laughs> would brag about stealing glass eyes from corpses. And while showing them off, he would say, quote, You know who they are? The glass eyes from dead bodies in Leeds. I'll wield the bodies around at night. And I love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. Know, it, and he says these things. And I guess I feel like people thought at the time, I mean, it's extreme. He's talking about mutilating corpses and yeah. stuff. So you think like, oh, Jimmy. Yeah, it's always you're oh, Jimmy. funny as he- Oh, you're being cheeky on in it. And then, you know, then he just might not have been. And he got away with it completely scot-free. Oh, yeah. It didn't come out until after he died. Yeah. And he yeah. passed it all down to Jimmy Carr. But no. I, uh, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> but he well you said we take, stayed at, we stayed in the same hotel as him once and he looked very perturbed the entire time. He looked time. very upset. Yeah. I've hung out with him a bunch. He's all right. At 8 out of 10 cats is a good show. I never saw it. It's a good it's in England. It's like a, you know, panel show. It's quite, it's it's quite fucking fun. The cats or no, it's a whole plant. It's one of those panel shows, oh, yeah, you know, true. where all the Brits have and fun. And they're like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's exactly like that. Yeah. But after all that, we finally arrive at class eight. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> this is where we find our classic necrophiles. Those who actually have sex with corpses, but don't kill to obtain the bodies they copulate with. This is it's literally, we're at an hour and change <laughs> into the episode, and we just got to fucking a corpse. It is a rainbow. I'm I know, I know. You, it's a this very is the com- indigo. Yeah. They do, however, go to great lengths to obtain these corpses, which separates them from class sevens. One class eight admitted that he would attend funerals and pose as a mourner so he could get a good look at the corpse to make sure that she was, quote unquote, worth digging up later. It's very Mr. Beanie. I'll be like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> mm, you know, like the look over there. Mm. But the necrophile who has the most famous quote attached to him is yet another Frenchman named Henri Blot, a.k.a. the Vampire of saint Noir. Now, Blot, a young Parisian waiter by day, wasn't actually that prolific because he got caught after only a second corpse. But Blot became famous for what he said in court after the judge expressed his horror concerning Blot's actions. From records, Blot said, Que voulez-vous? Chacun a ses passions, moi le cœur d'arbre, c'est la mienne. Translated to English, in which Henri sounds much different, that means... What do you want? We all have different desires. Mine's corpses. (laughs) (laughs) Sue me. (laughs) Henri turned into (laughs) Henry. Another more prolific necrophile, yet again French, was Victor Ardenson, the vampire of Mouy, who was captured in 1901. Perhaps the most disgusting necrophile we'll cover today. That's Buckle in on this one. This is saying a lot. So this is the worst. This is the worst, yeah. Okay, That's cool. close to it. I'd still... There's a couple... This one I would say... Well, mm. uh, let me... I'll refresh your memory on yeah. this guy. And I think by the time we get to the end, you may agree with me that this one is the grossest one. I'm not fighting. <laughs> but perhaps the most disgusting necrophile we'll cover today... Victor was aroused by a number of paraphilias, including kids, incest, blood drinking, and particularly big urine fan. Oh, he should be the vampire of pee. <laughs> Instead of me. <laughs> vampire of pee. It's very good. It's very, very good. Supposedly, when he was a young boy, he would lick the urine from the toilet seats of his classmates while masturbating in full view of anyone who cared to watch. Vampire of pee. <laughs> <laughs> he also drank his own semen after masturbation, saying, quote, It's a pity to let it go to waste. <laughs> <laughs> Not a charmer in the bunch. <laughs> in France, though, they use semen as coffee cream. Yeah, it is true. Yeah, 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 yeah. They make it into cheese. <laughs> now, in 1882, the town gravedigger died. And since there were only four or five burials a month in Victor's town, it wasn't a well-paying job. That's why it went to Victor Ardenson's stepfather, Honoré Ardenson. And Honoré often took Victor, then 10 years old, out on the job. 
Years later, though, after Honoré had a frightful experience in which he fell into a grave, injured his foot, and couldn't get out, no. the town decided to give the job to the local deviant, Victor Ardenton. I'll do it! <laughs> Fine. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> He'd grown into the profession. He'd been going out with his father for years. So. I love to do it. <laughs> and over the next few years, Victor would violate over 100 corpses. Now, Victor did have some aspects of a romantic necrophile, as he would often talk to the corpses he had sex with and would be genuinely upset when they didn't talk back. Don't act like I am not talking to you! <laughs> That's what you so much fun. <laughs> just like you're in the cemetery, just like... <laughs> he also became a bit of a cemetery pest, asking mourners from what disease the recently deceased had died. <laughs> He didn't want to catch anything. Yeah, he's no. curious. <laughs> he's curious, and he's just, you know. So far, the most responsible. <laughs> yeah, he's just asking questions. <laughs> More than anything, though, Victor was also a horrific necromutilomaniac. In one case, he dug up the recently deceased corpse of a 13-year-old girl, but upon finding her body too heavy to carry back home, he detached the head with the help of a pocket knife and kept the head at his stepfather's house. This is a part of the things they don't talk about. With we, I think we talk a little bit with the series and on the book with Ed Gein mm. about how physically strong you kind of have to be to be a grave robber. Yeah, it's really difficult. You know, he needed to work on, like, he needed to do some, like, Deadlifts. I mean, carrying 100 Literally. pounds of dead weight's really difficult. Yeah. They were all deadlifts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the first ones. <laughs> well, he then kept the head for kissing purposes until it putrefied and neighbors began to complain of the smell. Sorry, it's my girlfriend. She's from France. <laughs> <laughs> In his most disgusting venture, and this is where I think he gets put on top, Victor disinterred the corpse of a toddler and used it for so-called oral sex until the body completely putrefied into goo. According to Victor, he was hoping that he would bring the corpse back to life by having sex with it. But this corpse was also the one that got Victor caught. I don't think it's good. Nope. Since he couldn't bear to get rid of the toddler's corpse, he kept it in the attic, and neighbors began to complain of the smell. For some reason, though, Honoré, Victor's stepfather, was also keeping garbage in the attic. So he assumed that was the source of the odor. Yeah, but a, a rotting toddler, not that I know. Mm -mm. Yeah. But I don't think it smells like garbage. No, it smells like any other thing, anything, any kind of rotting flesh. Yeah. 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 But when he entered the attic to remove said garbage at the urging of his neighbors, he discovered the remains of the toddler lying on a straw bed that Victor had made himself. Honoré did not, however immediately recognized the small pile of putrefying flesh as a corpse. Since the attic was dark, Honoré assumed that the corpse was some kind of animal, so he struck it with a shovel and splattered the remains all over the room and himself. You gotta He's check that. Poor old man. Yeah. No, I mean, why is he keeping garbage in the attic? <laughs> he doesn't know anything. I'm just surprised he can still get upstairs. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't that old. He was in his 50s. Oh, okay. Yeah, just he was randomly a whacking something with a shovel. And also, Victor Ardenson, like, he he wasn't born in a vacuum. He came from a long line of psychopaths and deviants. Yeah, everyone's yeah. fucked up. All of the Ardensons were fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. They're hoarding garbage. Yeah, they're hoarding garbage in the attic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's strange. And this is the, in the days when garbage is just... Rot it's just rotting yeah, it's shit. Yeah, fish heads and shit. Yeah. yeah. But once Honoré realized what it was that he had thwacked with the shovel, he reported it to the authorities and Victor was placed under arrest. And to my previous point, it was soon discovered that the vampire of Mui had no sense of taste or smell. Yeah, I mean, I could tell by his shirt. <laughs> <laughs> he also showed no sign of remorse or regret although he did promise to never have sex with a dead body ever again I promise <laughs> and that's as good as jail <laughs> that promise however was not good enough Victor Artisan was sentenced to life in a psychiatric hospital where he died in 1944 aged 71 years old 43 years after he was captured. Man, never had a boring time in the lunchroom. No. That's for certain. <laughs> Anytime you sat by him, he had something horrible to say. <laughs> yeah, so far, he's bad. Yeah, he's an institution. I mean, that's he's kind of like how Ed Gein was. After Gein yes. was uh, captured, he, he lived for another 30 years oh. in an institution. Yeah, and they, and they all said, I actually, tell, did I ever tell you that I had a listener 
that we was I was that sent an email. We're talking about that was yeah. had worked with Ed Gein, whose family I believe father was had was working with him as like one of the the uh, mental asylum like assistants. Yeah, either like a, yeah, and he was uh, apparently very sweet. Everyone said he, he was a model. Ed Gein was like the sweetest guy around. He loved yeah. his mama. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he did Again, him. he loved her. Too much. He didn't. He never fucked his mother. I don't know how many times I have to tell you this. He was inside of her tits. I think it's enough. <laughs> <laughs> he never. He didn't. Oh, he yeah. never dug up his mother. I've told you this like dozens of times. I won't. He never dug up his mother. I'm not even getting in there. Ever. I won't let him. He get was in too it. afraid of her. So yeah. he never buried her. No, she was buried. Yeah, yeah, she was in the. Um, she was interred. She he would then go after people that looked like his mother. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. He he dug the grave. He dug up the grave next to his mother. Okay. Yeah, and you then know, many the woman more he killed looked that. like kind of looked like yeah. like a gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, it's easy to see how Victor Artisan could have made the jump from necrophilia to murder, and that brings us to class nine, the type of necrophile that we're all most familiar with. These are the homicidal necrophiles, your Bundys, your Dahmers, and such and such. And they look down on the other classes. Yeah, because these guys are made, baking their own bread. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, I make opportunities for myself. Yeah. But for an example of this type, we're going to go for a lesser-known criminal from the UK named David Fuller. See, I put him near the top of, like, the idea of your full necrophiliac, right? Like, he is fully in a necrophilia, and he's also, he is a murderer, but those are kind of, like, he started with murder. Yeah. And then just was like, this is a lot for me. I just like these fucking, I just gotta get these corpses. And I will say, like, it's gotta be a lot to see yourself. He did this, there was a documentary called Monster in the Morgue, David mm -hmm. Fuller. And there's a lot of, like, footage of him and kind of what he was talking about. And uh, just that poster of, like, you never want to find yourself on a poster for a movie. No. Where it's you outside of a morgue, like. Uh, like with a smile on it because nothing happened good no like yeah you didn't get the Heisman <laughs> you know what I mean if you're the monster of the morgue well sounds like he did get the Heisman of, <laughs> of killing you know what it was uh, just, just having sex with corpses now while David did kill two women in 1987 in separate attacks in their homes to do with the bodies what he would he wasn't caught for the crimes until the year 2020 when DNA finally matched him to the crime scene. I think it was one of those, wasn't it one of those sort of like uh, 23andMe, kind of like how they caught the uh, original Night Stalker. Yes, that's how they got him. Yeah. When police searched his home computer, though, they found a massive trove of images that captured his many crimes against the dead. Yeah. See, Fuller had access to the local hospital more. He was an uh, electrician. Yeah. And his hard drive was filled with over 4 million images of obscene and illegal acts, including thousands of pictures of him performing sexual offenses on corpses ranging in ages from 9 to 100. And they tried to get him on B. He was married uh, multiple times. Uh, he was married. He cheated on his wife, which is also really interesting because I also think, like, that's one of his biggest crimes. Nah. His adultery. <laughs> Amen. I mean, yeah, you know? Because think about that. You can't even stay loyal to your wife, and you're also fucking multiple corpses. Faithful you know? married men, all three here. Yeah, yeah, see? That's yeah, right. yeah, that's, that's right. what keeps us, that's what makes us hold the line. But um, he hid his, <laughs> he hid his hard drives filled with this stuff in a, like he had a desk, it was against a wall, and he carved a hole in the wall, so the hard drives would go, they were in a pocket, they were put behind a desk, and the hard drives would go up against the thing. They finally went in, they got a full, like, but you know, they talked to his family, fully kind of like, quote unquote, normal life. He would do all of the stuff, but it wasn't just, it was, you know, pedophilia, yeah. bestiality. Oh, it yeah. was all of it in one go. He was busy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was sending it to Bin Laden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's just go ahead and say yes. Yes. Yes, he was. <laughs> David also kept meticulous records of each victim, detailing the name and age of each one, which helped police identify no less than 80 victims. So one of the worst parts of them trying to identify everything is that you got to find, you basically had to watch the video of him fucking a corpse. Yeah. And then you had to try to capture, like this is what the cops are talking about. When the camera would catch a toe tag or catch an identifying mark, because he was also new. It was a lot of like on his face, yeah. like on a, oh, oh, I'm about to arrive. <laughs> and then back to corpse, like, you know, like it was, yeah. it wasn't great it wasn't cinematography. Yeah. It was more like a found footage film. It was for him. Yeah. yeah. You know, well, he, they asked him, they were like, why did you film this? And he just like, you know, he sat and thought, and he was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure those cops saved a lot of lunch that year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
You guys want to get another sweet green? Oh, you got, oh. Uh, oh. <laughs> Ironically, though, Fuller was able to carry on his photography hobby for so long because he knew which parts of the morgue were covered by CCTV and which ones weren't. So he was able to continue taking pictures of himself committing unspeakable acts on corpses just so long as he stayed out of the sight of the hospital's cameras. But when it comes to being a little too on the nose, David Fuller was also the quote-unquote unofficial photographer for the UK band Cutting Crew in the mid-80s. Now, David followed Cutting Crew on tour with his wife, which is strange considering how they were a one-hit wonder. But that number one spoke to David in a way that, say, Rock Me Amadeus, Two of Hearts, or any other 1986 hit could. This is David's song. Such hat bullshit. Must have been something you said. I just stayed in your arms tonight. Walk away. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You ever I mean, seen the video for this? Yeah, it's great. Do you think he's in? Because the video is just them photographing the band. Then the video was shot in Australia. Oh, I checked. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, why that song? I mean, I know that. I just died in your arms. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you no. like that. They died hours ago. Yeah, you know I, mean? I know. I think yeah. he just liked someone dying in someone's arms and it being a romantic. Must have been something you said. But I thought, I mean, I should have walked away. Whoa. Ah, guilt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Guilt. Guilt, guilt. Now, after class nines, you have the final category, the class 10. That is the exclusive necrophile, which is, that's actually the name of the magazine. It's not Angle Lush. Oh, it's good. Oh, <laughs> it's exclusive, exclusive, exclusive necrophile. Ne <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind that can't have any sexual experience with the living and must exclusively use the dead for their sexual needs. That's a gold star necrophile. Yeah, these are the rarest. This is yeah. your Andre Chikatilo's. Yeah. You're the Red Ripper. Yeah. He's a class 10. He literally couldn't get hard unless they were dead. Yeah. Oh, okay. But instead of covering... <laughs> <laughs> you should read the book. I wrote a whole chapter on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like the coloring book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they come and be like, I, got, I paint all these little uteruses pink, right? <laughs> <laughs> But instead of covering Chikatilo yet again, if you want to know about Chikatilo, you can go read the last book on the left. Wrote a whole, wrote a whole chapter Yeah, we about don't him. need to cover Chikatilo again. We don't. I put that band behind me. We thought that we'd leave you with one of the nicer necrophilic stories, relatively speaking. Okay. We're going to go all the way back to class two, the romantic necrophiles, for the story of Carl Tanzler. This is, again, if you think you're in love, I don't know if you are. Yeah. Carl Tanzler is a very necrophiliac last name. It really is. Well, uh, his real name is Carl von, it was, it's a, fi that's what he was known as, von, Carl von Kosel. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tanzler was his, like, American name, because oh. he was German. Oh. He was a German immigrant. He was a radiologist in his mid-50s. He immigrated to Florida, set up in Key West. That's incredible. That's a lot of Germans moved to Florida. Yeah, there's so many extra people in Key West. You can get, you, people just disappear all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, this is back in 1931. Oh, so we knew Hemingway. Yeah. yeah I, bet, I bet him and Hemingway. They, got, they definitely got hammered one night. Best buddies. <laughs> so, I saw how many toasts you can't have. <laughs> <laughs> well, he began working at a local tuberculosis ward. Oh. And it was there that he became obsessed with a 22-year-old Cuban tuberculosis patient named Maria Elena Milagro de Hoyos. Tanzler had arrived in America five years earlier with his family. They had settled in Zephyr Hills. Do you know Zephyr Hills? Yeah, yeah. it's it's for the spring water. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But don't buy the Zephyr Hills spring water. Don't. It's Nestle brand. They Nestle owns it. They're yeah. just stealing the water and selling it back to us. Those fucking sons of bitches ruining the good name of Zephyr Hills along with Tanzler. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not helping. <laughs> But Tanzler soon left his wife and child behind to romantically pursue the young dying Cuban. Now, there's no word on Elena's feelings concerning any of this, but we do know that Tanzler showered her with jewelry, clothing, and affection for 18 months until she finally succumbed to tuberculosis. Please, will you please stop giving me necklaces <laughs> and bring me medicine? I do not need more chocolate. What I need is medicine. <laughs> <laughs> I do not know why you keep doing this. <laughs> this 
Death, however, did not end Tanzler's obsession. Finally. <laughs> Using his own money, Tanzler built a massive mausoleum for Elena de Hoyos and preserved her body in formaldehyde. For the next two years, he visited her corpse to talk to it and even went so far as to install a working telephone in the mausoleum to complete the fantasy that she might one day call back. Now, this is th this is not that bad yet. Can no. I ask a question? Sure. So, he, he, was she like a big jar? Like, with yeah. a bunch of formaldehyde? Yeah, basically. Like, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, think, yeah. no, she wasn't in a big she jar. No. They no. just filled the coffin with formaldehyde? I think he just, like, dabbed her with formaldehyde. Oh, I, that's okay. a, I don't know for sure. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but I don't think it was in a big jar. It wasn't like a... Yeah, 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 yeah. Honey. <laughs> but either way, she wasn't in there long. No. She, well, she was in there for two years. Uh, and God, it's so hot down there, too. Yeah, inside an unventilated mausoleum in Key West. Oh, my God. And he went there almost every day. Oh. Yeah. And he finally, well, maybe that's why he finally decided to cut the commute. And he brought the body to his own home. The corpse, though, had decomposed past the point of recognition. Because it's fucking Florida. Bodies decompose fast Oh, in yeah, Florida. buddy. Oh, yeah. and if you look at her, too, wow. You look at her, oh, well, beautiful yeah. makeup job. Buddy. Yeah. Well, Tanzler effectively restored the body. Using piano wire and coat hangers to keep the corpse's bones together, Tanzler also gave it glass eyes and a wig. Ah, there you are. <laughs> ah, your corals are restored once again. <laughs> the rotted skin was replaced with silk, and the putrefied organs were removed and replaced with rags. The piece de resistance was a paper tube that replaced the vagina, mm. so Tanzler could have sex with the corpse. I don't know if you have these paper straws or anything like that tube. <laughs> <laughs> so you might as well. I mean, like, who cares about the turtles? I would imagine he would have to replace it with fair regularity. Yeah. So oh, I see it is your time of the month. <laughs> 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 well, this went on for seven years until Elena's sister finally discovered what Tanzler had been doing to Elena's corpse. The sister reported Tanzler to the police, and the body was buried in an unmarked grave while Tanzler was in jail, all so he could never find and disturb the body ever again. This, however, didn't stop the fantasy. Tanzler replaced the corpse with a life-size doll replica of Elena using her death mask, and he lived with it until his death in 1952. It's not bad. See, that's what they all should be doing. He seems like the most tame of everybody. Well, yeah. I mean, he did steal and defile the corpse of a woman who may or may not have been extremely annoyed with his constant advances. We don't know. I didn't say it was great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Again, that's not why a charmer. Said, that's why I said but... relatively, it's relatively sweet. It's definitely sweet compared to the guy who ripped his mother's guts out through her abdominal wall. Actually, Absolutely. I understand that too, in a way. In a way? Well, just kind of, he's got to be sad. He's, he is sad. Mm -hmm. Well, let's leave you with the seemingly romantic words of Carl Tanzler, which show the depths of his madness. Long I lay thus, holding her closely to me, the living and the dead, united in love. The sweetness of this was divine. Never had I dreamt that she had preserved so sweet and intense a love for me after being in the grave for so long. Was it possible? I could hardly grasp or believe it. But here was the undeniable evidence. Life and death united together. I to I. Cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. You never write. We got to write something to Julie now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. Meet you at Sloppy Joe's. <laughs> 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 How I love your boobies <laughs> and the way I get access to them. <laughs> wow. Yep, that's necrophilia. Not good work, man. This Thanks. is yeah. good. I was really excited about this topic. I think we really, we really did it. I think yeah. we did it. Yeah. Like you, you mentioned it to me yesterday, and I felt the same way. I am pleasantly not that upset. Yeah, I, right. You know what it is? Again, we talked about this. Is that when I, I don't care what you do to my corpse. I don't fucking. It's a body is trash when yeah. you're done with it. Yeah, yeah. But it's just more like then you got to deal with that guy. Yeah. Like it's the guy. It's, the, it's not behavior you want to encourage. <laughs> like you really want, we want, I think that's the thing about the laws is that it's just, we just want to know. We don't want guys having sex with corpses in a, in a society in general. We just yeah. don't want it. We just don't want that to happen. Yeah, because I don't mind. Again, I believe that we are over-policed yes. and we are yes. over-punished. But I think that in this case, 
They might need to make an example it, out of some of these guys. It needs to be discouraged. Discouraged. Yeah. It needs to be greatly discouraged. Which if is you why are going to do it, do it in Oklahoma where it is legal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they need to be sprayed with, like, you know, you keep a cat. You got to spray. You got to put lemon juice on the corpse or something. <laughs> Some things is not going to be into. <laughs> spray with Axe body spray. Make it not smell like a corpse. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, well, maybe, yeah, some of them do have a good sense of smell, and they like the smell of death. They do. I'm some sure of some, them do. Yeah, some of Kat, them that's very what, much What's do. her name? Greenlee talked about how she liked the smell of the corpse, and yeah. she only liked it when the fucking blood was coming out of the mouth. That was her version of coming. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we live it like that. Now, we have a lot of shit coming down the fucking pipe. Yeah. Next week, we're going to announce our new brand of coffee. It is going to be, it's fucking tasty. I made it for my mother this morning, and she straight up said, Henry Thomas, I got to say, this is very delicious coffee. And then she proceeded to put four sweet and lows in it. And so she <laughs> did, but she did originally taste it. Yes. And it was very, very good. I'm very excited. And we're not coffee snobs here. You can have your coffee however you like. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's nice. I like it just with milk. Mm-hmm. Should we really be advertising food right now? <laughs> <laughs> it's coffee. Coffee is very food safe. Yeah, it's not yeah. like his last podcast in the left stroganoff. <laughs> you know what I mean? That would be a difficult sell. You know? Jarred stroganoff. I think it'd be good to hide a body in a bunch of coffee beans. Yeah. Yeah, co in coffee grounds. Yeah. Actually, that's a great idea. Yeah. Well, let's ask Columbia. Yeah, so how much how much coffee do you have for sale? <laughs> <laughs> Ten million pounds. Um, but then we also have Operation Sunshine. It is now out. It is released next week. Operation Sunshine number two is going to come out to your local comic book store. Go and check it out. Go check it out. And then we just reminded everyone we are for certain coming to Australia next summer. We're Fuck, gonna figure yes. out we're gonna figure out what that is. I don't know what it is. But that's just the beginning of a bunch of new shit. We're very, very excited. Uh what the fuck else? Yeah, I mean, we just uh, got some, I mean, just all kinds of cool shit going on. Don't forget to uh, streams. Go, don't forget to go to twitch.tv slash uh, we, LPN TV. We have a new address for our Twitch channel. It's twitch.tv slash LPN TV. Yes, and we got yes. No Dogs in Space every other Monday. Good Hood mm -hmm. is coming back. We're going to do another Good Hood right before we leave for our little Thanksgiving break, November 16th. And starting this week, the last stream on the left is going to be moving time. So yes. if you out there in the you know East Coast or beyond, uh, if the last time is too late for you, we're now going to be doing it at 6 p.m. PST, yes. 9 p.m. EST. So That's we can, our new I'd, I'd imagine we can have a lot more people watching it live. Go join our Patreon if you want to watch that live. It's a good time. There's a bunch of people in the chat. It's a lot more fun to interact with people live. So come yeah. on out. Check it's it out. It's fun as hell. Come see the show. That's yeah. right. And then you and can watch us do the episode on Patreon as well. Yes. Yeah. Well, you can see all the videos of us slapping around, fucking around, yeah. being fucking big idiots and shit. Yeah, mm -hmm. every other Wednesday, Brighter Side on LPN TV. Yes. And I'll be in Brea on uh, November 17th and 18th, opening for Jeff Ross. So come check. I'm doing a nice, healthy set. So come check it out. That's, yeah. Is that the Brea oh, yeah. Improv? Yes, the Brea Improv. Yeah, go check it out, man. It's gonna be I don't think awesome. they do comedy anywhere else in Brea. No, no, no. The rest <laughs> of it's just, just angry people about the vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, hail Satan. Oh, hell, Gene. And I love all of you. Hail so, me. Especially the ones that have sex with dead people. See, we're looking at you, <laughs> volunteer fireman. We're looking at you. This show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors. You can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com.